Guillermo. Emil, I'm up to you. What a night, huh? I mean, it was an early night. I mean, uh, it gave me time to reflect. What just happened? What did we spend $277 million or maybe close to $300 million? When all said and done with all the money spent by the candidates, what did we just do in California with this recall effort? So we're going to talk about the recall. We're going to talk about uh, the election in Ka and Ma, California and Massachusetts. In terms of the AAPI, those are the, well, they were the two, they were the only places with elections yesterday, California and Massachusetts, but significant to Asian Americans. I mean, Asian Americans were 17% of uh, the, the registered vote. Unfortunately, only 7% turned out. That's not too good. Did some Asian Americans say, I'm not showing up? Oh, well, apparently they did. Fortunately, it didn't matter. That, that wasn't a landslide. That was called a, that was a major a tectonic eruption that we saw uh, yesterday. Not a landslide. My goodness. I mean, to lose by uh, nearly 30 points, 30 percentage points, I, there's, I think they're still counting. I don't have the final numbers in front of me, but from what I'm seeing reported, uh, that was a repudiation, a massive repudiation. So we'll talk about that. Um, a lot of birthdays. You know, I, I do this show and I talk about, you know, the birthdays that, that show up on Facebook you know, that alert me. I mean, that's what Facebook's good for. Of course, if you've been reading the Wall Street Journal, you know that there are these secrets about Facebook that are being revealed that uh, uh, don't indicate uh, such a, a nice, uh, well, they aren't exactly a society-friendly company. Uh, not when you give special treatment to certain groups, especially politicians, and they abuse it. So it seems like there was a like different tiers for different people at Facebook, according to the Wall Street Journal, and it was abused by people of privilege. That doesn't sound like a very democratic thing when you're trying to be the web for everybody. And then today there was a thing saying that, hey, Facebook knows how toxic Instagram is. These companies know what they're doing, but then it comes back to, well, these companies also uh, allow me to do this. So there is a, a, you know, this tendency to be, uh, you know, pro democracy. I say tendency because, you know, then you can say, well, look, look at the people getting, who get shut out, who get censored. Well, that's why I look at my show as I'm, I'm the antidote to all the toxic stuff that's online. I mean, all the, all the folks who are anti-vaxxers, I say, go vaccinate. That's easy. All the other places that are racist and, you know, anti-Asian. And I say, Hey, I'm pro Asian, pro Asian American. I talk about Asian America. Like we matter here on a meal amongst takeout. I talk about all the Asian angles that get left out, that, that don't get mentioned. Or when they get mentioned, it just flies by. You don't even notice. You say, oh, we, they talked about us? Yeah, they talked about us. Anyway. All right. So I got a lot of birthdays to talk about. And a passing of Norm MacDonald. Man. I mean, I knew he was not feeling well. I mean, I knew that there were some health things. Uh, going on with him. And I, but it was a surprise that he was that close to death. But apparently, on some videos, he looked like he was going through therapy or something because he was growing a beard. I think he was wearing a cap, indicating that he had lost his hair. From the, I mean, I know a number of people right now who are going through uh, chemo and. It's tough. It's not a good. It's not a good time. I mean, you got to surround yourself with people you love and get support. Of course, when you're an entertainer, you know you live for those laughs. You live to live for your audience, 
Anyway, I got a couple. I got one Norm Macdonald story that I'll share with you later. Uh, just because he he was an important comic. He was an important comic. He, I guess he will become more legendary now. In death, he will become more legendary. Uh, there's Everyone's on YouTube now uh, just replaying the shaggy dog stories that he, he loved to tell. The one about the moth is kind of funny. Because he just had this style, this way about him. And yet he was also a technician when it comes to joke writing. He just knew the setup and the punch and he just, he worked it. He, he knew the structure of jokes. If you are a stand-up fan, uh, like I have been, you know, throughout my life and uh, also a writer, you, you could tell his appreciation when he, like when he was on, uh, you know, some of the, I guess it was last comic stand. He was a judge, right? I mean, he, and he would take apart the structure of jokes of, that people were telling and he knew know exactly what was wrong. The guy was a, a master of his craft and uh, I appreciated him for that. So uh, I've got, I've got this uh, story uh, to share when I, when I, when I met Norm Macdonald, it was, I mean, I, it was a moment that I'll never forget. And it happened on my birthday a couple a uh, couple years ago. So I'll share that story. But, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, so a lot of personal stuff that we'll put at the end. Uh, in the meantime, let's begin with the, the election. I mean, when you saw it happening in real time, first of all, I was a little upset that there were so many lines. I mean, they, I mean, there were some polling places where you could just walk in, drop off your ballot or go in and do your thing. Uh, like they showed one on, on television of a, a polling place. Hey, it, it, there was no lines, but then they, they go to another County and there were lines around the block. They chose Sacramento and lines around the block. They show places. Oh, you know, all the parking spaces empty, right? Hey, just come on in. That's something about the democracy. You get here in line, you want to vote and and you're waiting 50 minutes, that's a discouragement. You know, so one thing off the bat, boy, we got to do something about not just the counting of the votes, that's important, but we got to do something about making sure that people have access and can vote and it doesn't take too long. As I say this, you know, this is why Californians especially have turned to mail-in ballots. I'm a permanent mail-in voter. If you're not a permanent mail-in voter in California, you're missing out. I mean, that's the convenience of, of voting. I mean, there are other things you can do to make voting convenient, like voting on Saturday, voting 24 hours, voting online. But then there's security issues, uh, issues about, well, you know, everyone has doubts about the integrity of the system, unfounded, but you know, once you say, oh, let's try online voting or let's try something else. Well, then they get, you know, they get nervous and they get all of a sudden traditional. They say, well, I'm going to drop my ballot off. Look, I know how that, how they feel. Those conservatives who say that, because I'm, I'm the same way. I'm not conservative, but I, I mailed in my ballot today. Ordinarily, I go to the registrar. I drop my ballot off because I like going to the polling place. I like going to a polling place and I like being, being active, actively voting. I mean, that's when you cheer, you should be cheering when you vote, right? I am, I'm exercising my franchise. So, uh, you shouldn't feel like, oh my God, it's so discouraging to vote. So that to me, that was the biggest lesson that no matter where you are in the country, you don't have to be in California to get that lesson that we should make it easy to vote. And, and yet what are we doing now? What are we seeing throughout the country in places like Texas, in places like Georgia, 
we're seeing efforts made to restrict voting, to make it harder, to make it almost to make it illegal to give someone a chair and a, and a bottle of water to aid someone who's waiting in line. We're seeing we're seeing all these kind of of add ons to, to laws that restrict voting rights. And why? It's because the side that is pushing those can't win an election any other way. Their policies aren't worth a darn. The only way they can win an election is to make it as restrictive as possible, to make voting as repulsive as possible, so that the small minority of people who support their conservative right-wing positions can amalgamate and give them a slim majority because they know that everyone else is going to be turned off. They're not going to care. That's, it seems to me, to be the way Republicans and conservatives are trying to fight this wave, this democratic or demographic shift. I say democratic. I don't mean to jump the gun and say the demographic shift is all democratic. But it tends to be if we're seeing this browning of America, this, uh, you know, this this change in our demographics that is making people who are white, conservative and generally Republican very scared. So this was kind of a, a dress rehearsal in California for the future. It's like, uh, let's, let's see what happens in one of the most diverse states. Let's see what happens in a state that, all right, Republicans have been declining. Why has that been so? People are leaving the state. People are changing their minds and becoming more independent. In fact, the, the uh, voters yesterday, the, the actual voters yesterday on, on the turnout, let's see, uh, the by identification it was oh i didn't get the democrat republican on on, on my paper here but but it, it showed that democrats were first then independents and then republican there are a lot of people turned off by how the republican party is dealing with the demographic changes in our country i mean the, the and look the republican party was pretty normal uh, say during the time of Bush, they knew that, okay, we're going to go big tent. We're going to embrace everyone. We're going to embrace Latinos. We're going to embrace Asians and, and African-Americans. They had that going on 2015, 2016. That was going to, that was their, essentially their playbook. Trump comes in, changes the playbook. That's what happened. I saw the big tent strategy of the GOP. It, it, there were forms of it back in the Bush days, 2000. And then it, it slowly evolved. 2016, they were making a massive push into the Asian American uh, community and making it big tent and diverse. And suddenly, God, Trump comes in, total change. Here we are, 2021, the party is beholden to Trump, everyone thinks Trump is the way, and we needed the recall yesterday to remind people that Trumpism, to use Gavin Newsom's phrase, Trumpism may not be dead, but it takes a strong effort among people, sane people, people with common sense, to turn it back and say, no, let's repudiate Trumpism, California, California is no different than, than any other state in the country. I mean, people say, oh, California and fruits and nuts and flakes. And no, California is no different. You look at the state and I live in a, a part of the country or a part of the state, which is among the redder parts, but it's now not red. It's getting less red it's becoming somewhat more neutral. I mean, San Joaquin County, the Stockton area, 
was no by about three, four points in in the recall effort. To the south, Stanislaus County, where Modesto is, was yes, but only by one or two percentage points. It wasn't it was closer, but it wasn't a resounding yes, like if you go out to the foothills, out to out, you know, north of Chico or to the foothills, or as you get closer to the edge of the state to the east, that's where you see the red parts of the state. But they get the percentage, but they don't get the population. They don't get the votes. The middle is becoming less red, more blue. The coasts are becoming a solidified blue. That's California. And I think also it should be a message to the nation that, you know, California may seem ultra progressive to many people, but I don't see anything progressive about wearing a mask. I don't see anything progressive about mask, uh, about uh, vaccine mandates. Somehow in California, if you're the, outside of California looking at that, that's really ultra progressive. That, there's nothing progressive about common sense health, public health matters. And I think it was good that the recall effort happened because it's like Monday night football. You know, it's the only game. Oh, there was that other race in Massachusetts and we'll talk about that also, but uh, like Monday night foot football, it was a thing that everyone was focused on. The, the networks came in, swooped down. They covered it like crazy. CNN was all over it. In fact, CNN had one of the few, uh, the only exit poll that I saw. You know, they, they were the ones who identified uh, uh, the, the electorate, 56% white, 25% Latino, 7% black, 7% uh, Asian, which was a surprise because there are more Asians than blacks. Now, Asians now are about 17% of the electorate, but in terms of turnout, only 7% turned out. There's another 5% in the mix, but that's this is according to the exit polls of uh, CNN. Uh, the other thing you got to consider is the strong female vote. 53% female, let's see, 47% male, in, according to exit polls. And then the, the big issues, coronavirus, 31%, homelessness, 22%, economy, 17%. So it's not, economy at 17%, not very important, really. I mean, important, but, you know, important with wildfires, 14%, crime, only 8%. That was a big issue with the, the GOP. Oh, law and order. Yeah, look at the troops. We're going to march down the street and get those, you know, I'm going to wave my Bible in front of the church. That was a Trump back during the, the BLM march, right? But law and order, 8%. I mean, it's not a concern. The big concern was, and it should be the concern nationwide. It should be the coronavirus. And I've said this all, all along in my columns uh, on the ALDEF site and wherever my columns are placed, but aaldef.org slash blog. Hey, Vax Americana, we got to go toward defeating this war on COVID or, or winning the war on COVID, defe defeating the virus. We get 650,000 dead. I mean, that's, and, and they didn't have to be if we had a stronger policy. And now a week after Biden gives his biggest speech yet, you know, calling for mandates, vaccine mandates in, you know, among federal employees and for, for large employers. This is a change, a change in America. And now America sees how the state that knows how, I mean, San Francisco used to be known as the city that knows how. California has to lead the way as the state that knows how. And look, believe me, California has had its ups and downs. And when California opened up in June, somewhat prematurely, well, we see the spike, you know, now in, in September, and it's actually slightly receding. 
But, you know, we've had our ups and downs throughout the, the pandemic. But overall, if you look at the pandemic map of California and compare it to Texas, Alabama, Louisiana, Florida, all those red states that are red politically and red COVID wise, America should look a lot more like California's blue COVID wise. But you're only going to look that way COVID wise if you're also politically now the way California is and the way California showed up, you know, at the, uh, at the recall election on, uh, on Tuesday. So a lot of people try to poo poo the results saying, ah, of course, California is going to vote no on this. Well, I'll tell you this. It was not a slam dunk when I wrote my column, uh, back on August uh, 13th. Diversity in the recall efforts, January 6th thing of California. You can read that on the ALDF site too at aldf.org slash blog. And, you know, I was talking about uh, the, the news at that time about how, you know, the census results are coming out and how the minorities are becoming the majority. Diversity, a big deal in the state, big deal in the nation. And uh, that was the top story, but that's when Gavin Newsom put it in the gear and said, I, I got to do something about this recall election because he had to make people care in the state about, about the recall and how important it was to vote no on the recall. And for you Asian Americans out there, it's important to know that Gavin Newsom, when the first things he did was hold press conferences with the Asian American press to let people know how important the AAPI community was. And so I asked him a question. I'll, I'll play this again because, you know, the, when I wrote my column, I said, because I sensed from Newsom how scared he was, scared enough to start raising a lot of money. I think he spent in excess of $80 million to fight this. On top of the 270 to 300 million that this costs the state, we're talking about millions of dollars. Was it a waste? Well, it got people people's attention. Got the got Newsom's attention that he's got to do something because he he back back in August it was almost like a coin flip. And so I asked him this question, could you win without the AAPI vote? And here's what he said. Let's see. Here's, here's what he said. Hi, Governor. Hey, uh, I'm talking. My question is, how critical is the Asian American vote and the ethnic vote in general to your success? Can, can you win without us? You know, I, I think you, you may recall, you know, when I first... Uh, ran for mayor. We won a close race. Um, you may recall the next morning, I went down to Chinatown symbolically and substantively in San Francisco to thank everybody. I would not have won that race without the overwhelming support of the Asian community, broadly defined, Filipino community, not just Chinese community, the Japanese across the spectrum, Korean. I mean, I was so proud of that. And I invested a tremendous amount of time and energy to meet the needs of the Asian community as, as mayor. It's the reason I think we won that re-election with over 70% of the vote. I believe it's why I was elected lieutenant governor with that support. This has been a tough year and a half. And, and I, I know how anxious and everybody's felt and stressed and fearful this last year and a half. How many small businesses have been impacted? As so many parents like myself, the, the stress of homeschooling our kids and and, and all the anxieties around learning loss. And, and so I've worked to do, to earn back that trust, but I've got a record of advocacy, not just passive support, deep advocacy, commitment uh, to advance the needs of the APBI community. And so the answer to your question is, no, I can't, I can't win this without Some of the key people that I've had the privilege to appoint. 
appoint to positions of real power and influence, perhaps the most powerful and influential, the Attorney General of the state of California. And we have just spent, I've been only 30 months, you know, I feel like we got it that first year and that's that first year we're just sort of winding up and then this last 18 months of this pandemic and, and we're just getting started. And so I'm, I'm trying to make that case to the community and, uh, and we're doing everything uh, to, to, to encourage and enliven and, uh, and generate that support uh, for no on recall. Yeah, you're gonna, just a follow up, you know, the Asian American community has grown more diverse over the years and it could be up to maybe 30 percent republican in some areas there are asian american republicans who are very strong on those issues they may just follow suit and say yeah you know recall uh it's divided some families and we're going to have to talk or some families are going to talk to others and say hey well why are you voting this way you should vote look at what look at what governor newsom has done why or what would you say to those people those Asian Americans who have people down south around, you know, the, the areas uh, where there's strong Republican support uh, among I'm Asian married, Americans. I'm married in a big Republican family. Uh, I have great respect for people uh, of all political stripes. And that's why my opening statement, I said, I, I'm not walking away from those Republican strongholds. Uh, we happen to have the privilege just to be there with the Republican mayor of Fresno, I, I signed a bill just last week that directly impacts and benefits the API community as related to expanding health care, in-home supportive services, and long-term care for people regardless of their immigration status, recognizing how many mixed status families we have within the API community, not just the Latino community. But I hope people will pause and consider the anti-Asian hate that was spewed by Donald Trump and those that embrace Trumpism. That's the crop of people we have that would replace this administration. This is serious. These are the folks, you know, trust me, they don't have the backs of the API community. They, they want to eliminate our progress on masking and, and vaccinations. They want to take us down the path of Florida. By the way, I'll remind you again, California outperformed Florida on not just health outcomes, but economic outcomes. Our economy contracted at a much more modest rate than those states. So by economic measures, by economic output, productivity, household income, factory jobs, innovation, investing in our future and our diverse communities, I hope folks, regardless of their political stripes, consider the consequences. And again, the chaos that would ensue at a time when we all want to turn the page on this pandemic and get back to some semblance of normalcy. The impact of a recall to disrupt the progress we have made in this state in the last few months is pronounced and profound. And I hope those families can consider that when they're debating around those kitchen tables, the merits and demerits of this recall. So that's uh, Gavin Newsom. When I talked to him, this was like a month ago. I said, why can you win without us? He said, Categorically, no, I can't win without a, the Asian American book. Only 7% of us showed up and, you know, and turned out for the, for the vote. But he valued us. You heard him explain. And if you look at those counties to the south, I'm talking about Orange County and Riverside. My God, they turned out. They turned out and they were not resoundingly no, but... They weren't yes, they were no, and uh, these are Republican strongholds. So you know that there are moderate Republicans who saw what this recall effort was about. They saw the the leader who emerged, Larry Elder, right, the uh, Republican uh, talk show host, and they said, no, we don't need him. And they went for the moderate Newsom. Now, Newsom has a lot of leeway. So he can go to the extreme left and he can come to the center because there's no one filling that center now from the Republican Party because they've all gone to Trump. Kevin McCarthy, Devin Nunez, they're all far right. Where does that leave the reasonable Republican? 
and I saw a lot of Filipinos who I would call reasonable Republicans. I saw a lot saying, you know, just towing the Trump line, saying, "Oh yeah, we're going to vote for the re- we're going to vote yes on the recall." But apparently, you look at the you you look at the the vote, the overwhelming. Like I said, it's more than just a landslide. It's like. This is what I call the digital divide in action. I'm making my points and then, I, you know, we lose our, our Internet. And I'm directly plugged in, too. You know, but as I was saying that, you know, maybe if the Asian Americans were 17 percent of the electorate and only 7 percent actually showed up to turn out, it could be that 10 percent said, there's no way I'm going to trust this. Maybe they're the conservative Asians that say, I'm not voting. I mean, there's no way we can say we can we can say no exit polls. Just speculation on my part, but we didn't show up in, in the great numbers, but the numbers who did resoundingly voted against the recall. I just want to say that I, I you know, when I, when I talked to, to Newsom back then, my God, he, he did seem he seemed not he seemed concerned. He seemed very concerned. He had Rob Bonta out there with him. He had, uh, you know, the the Filipino American uh, Attorney General, who he just appointed. As a reminder, hey, look, I gave you guys some power. I think overall, it worked. And now, some of the rumblings you're hearing now. Before the polls closed, Donald Trump came out and said, "Oh, the California is rigged." And Larry Elder refused to answer the question from NBC uh, a day before saying, you know, whether he would honor the results. But apparently in the concession speech Elder gave last night, he showed a certain graciousness. So I don't see anyone out there clamoring that the election was rigged or that there is something fake. There can't be something fake when you lose an election by uh, 30 percentage points. Where's the rigging? The rigging is, oh, it shouldn't have been 30 percentage points. If it was rigged, it would be like a Saddam Hussein election, and it would have been like 100% to one, to zero. That would be, oh, I think something's wrong. I think that election is rigged. That's the Saddam Hussein Factor or the Saddam Hussein, uh, you know, rubric, you know, of uh, rigged elections. But when you lose by 30 percentage points, that's not rigged. That's you've you've got a bad set of ideas. You got a bad set of candidates. You got a bad. The recall effort is doesn't make sense. In fact, that's one of the things now they're talking about recalling the recall or at least changing it so that you don't have the prospects of the candidates, the 46 candidates on the second question. If the recall effort was successful and the yes is won, you could add someone with less than the majority of the vote take over and be governor. As it was, there was one overwhelming candidate, Larry Elder, who I think will now use this recall effort to establish himself as some kind of Republican force. I sure as heck hope not, because he's not what the he's not what the country needs. He's not what California needs. So one of the things I've also heard is people questioning whether or not this was too easy a situation for really uh, for Gavin Newsom to be humbled. Can you really be humbled when you win by 30 30 percentage points? No, you're humbled. See, this is why I think he's got to play up the fact that he was really at the brink 30, 30 days ago when I played that interview that I played where I asked him that question. 
he really has to cop to the fact that he was sweating bullets back then because it appeared like it was a coin flip. It appeared like, oh, my God, uh, you know, it's going to be a national effort and the Republicans are going to pour money and they're going to make it a they're 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 going to they're going to take over this election. Fortunately, what it shows is that there are enough people, there are more than a majority of people who think the whole Trump thing was total BS. The whole Trump thing needs to be repudiated, not just in California, but throughout the country. And pity the Republicans who lack the guts and lack the balls to stand up to the bully Trump. I think there's a there's a space now open for a conservative, for a Republican who is a little more moderate, who's a little more reasonable. Not Larry Elder, but someone else with a tad more charisma, a tad more common sense policies that would force Newsom on the left to move more toward the center. That's going to upset people who are progressive, of course. But here's the thing. The other things uh, among the other comments I heard about last night is that, wow, Newsom, after looking like he was just dead in the water, he was bypassed by Senator Harris, who gets plucked for for national worldwide, uh, you know, acclaim or a national or international platform as the vice president, right? Here's Newsom. His fortunes look sagging. He's hit with this, this recall. He's going nowhere, right? And it's always been Kamala and Gavin, San Francisco politicians vying for their next gig, right? Kamala, district attorney, to AG, to Senate, to VP, right? Here's Gavin Newsom, mayor, lieutenant governor, to governor, stalled. Presidency next? I mean, that that was the talk. And, and then for a long time, you could shelve that idea. But now, now I think it's back. It's back in consideration. A mature Gavin Newsom. I mean, I think that's the outcome there. And then in terms of Elder, one thing I heard during the race is about, you know, oh, Elder is going to replace Feinstein, who might, who might, uh, retire. Well, guess what? Gavin Newsom is one of Feinstein's favorites. Gavin Newsom, part of that San Francisco machine with Feinstein. I think that Elder, if he doesn't run for governor, I don't think he has what it takes Nash uh, within the state to be governor, but he might want to run for Senate. I think he'd appoint himself if he were governor. If he if he won the recall, or if he won, if the recall was successful and Elder won, I'd say that one of his first moves would be to say, you know, I'm not really qualified to be governor. I really want to appoint myself senator. That's what he would have done. Anyway, so a lot to say about uh, the recall. Like I said. One opinion, um, one editorial that I saw this morning said, well, maybe this was too easy for, for Newsom. No, I don't think so. I think, he was, I think he was pretty scared a month ago. I think he got calmer as we approached the, 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 the election, election day. But a month ago, I don't think he knew. I, I, I honestly don't. I think he was kind of scared. He got a scare and then he got calm 
when he raised his money and they got information about where, where the state was. He also got help by COVID because COVID is, it's the demarcation line in, between the state and the red states that are suffering the high rates of hospitalization and COVID cases and deaths and the blue state, California. We have our issues here, but we're much bluer, not red, like Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. And frankly, look, when I saw the results pour in, I was kind of happy that I was, wasn't amongst the crowd of people who said, oh, heck with California, the economy, the homelessness, the fires, we're leaving, we're going to Texas. Look, I did Texas. I did Texas in the 70s and 80s. I'm glad to be home in California. I'm glad to be home in California. I'm, and I'm proud to be a Californian. Where the most Asian Americans in the nation live, where we can rely on logical, common sense, public health type of approaches to these massive problems that our, that, that our country is facing. I mean, I think it's fairly obvious after yesterday. All right, Massachusetts. Ka and Ma. Massachusetts had another race. It's important because Michelle Wu is going to be a player. She's a she's gonna she's gonna be in a runoff in November. If she got a majority, she could have won it outright, but it was against five people. That wasn't gonna happen. One could have hoped, but She's going to face a uh, another member of the council, and uh, her name is Anissa Saeb George, and she's a council member uh, from you know Eastern European descent, American. It's going to be a, an interesting race because Michelle Wu is going to be seen as the progressive and Issa St. George is going to be seen as the kind of the moderate, the, the centrist. What's interesting is the three African-American candidates, including the acting mayor, Kim Janey did not make the runoff. So I, I hope you find, or will find some solidarity among people of color, Asians, African-Americans, and the Latinx communities in Boston. We have from now till November to build that coalition. I think it's going to happen. And if it happens, it means that 36-year-old Michelle Wu pres uh, could become mayor of Boston and could, you know, that, that that's, that's a stepping stone. That's a stepping stone to higher office, gubernatorial race, Senate race, congressional race, a female AAPI figure, Michelle Wu, Harvard Law, Harvard grad from Chicago. She's, a, as I mentioned yesterday in show 136, she's a caregiver. She takes care of her mom. Those are Asian American values. And I think they're attractive ones when you think of public service. What do you want to see in a public service? You want to see someone who has those caretaker values, who can be a leader as well. Watch out, Michelle Wu, the Boston mayoral race. All right. Uh, Okay, we're going to wrap up. We're going to do our, um, let me talk about Norm MacDonald. You know, it was 2016 that I was working on my, I mean, I do this thing. I do these news meditations. I talk, uh, I did talk shows, right, in my broadcast career. I mean, I was a television reporter, radio reporter, radio anchor, but I was also a, a talk show host. And uh, Washington, D.C., in Sacramento, San Francisco. And I, 
it, it's an instinct to just like pick up the paper and want to talk. The news talk, right? And I, I turned to column writing. And through the column writing, I turned to more storytelling. And not necessarily acting, but storytelling, humorous storytelling, jokes, speech, speechifying. And uh, I, I did some stand-up comedy around 2015, 2016. I still do some. COVID kind of ended that because, well, now people are going back to the clubs, people are going back to Broadway, but you got to sign a thing saying, hey, I'm vaxxed, I'm wearing a mask. I, I, you know, I'm not ready to go back in public in those kind of things. I'm, I'm happy in this Zoom sort of kind of arena. But it was about 2016 that I, I, I just saw a lot of comedians. So I wanted to see what I wanted to see their live performance. And the guy that I thought was the guy to follow. Well, all right, Louis C.K. was a guy, but I didn't get to see him live. I, I, I like female comics a lot, but of the male comics, it was Norm MacDonald. For me, it was always Norm MacDonald. I'd see his tapes. I'd see him uh, on YouTube. And he was appearing in San Francisco. So I went uh, to... Uh, uh, to the club, I guess that's I guess that's Cobb's, right? I, I, in on on Broadway or on Columbus, I forget the name. I guess it's Cobb's. Um, and it was it was great. He was funny. I, I I went up to him afterwards. We took a selfie. We we chatted. We had a, a friend in common. He said, "Oh, you know," and I said, "Yeah, I know." And he and he was. And what I liked about Norm Macdonald is that he wasn't that far from my age. In fact, I'm a little older than Norm Macdonald. And what do you see in the, the lead? Norm Macdonald, dead at 61. Young guy. And, you know, he was my example of you could do this as an old guy. You could tell stories. You can tell jokes. You could be humorous, a humorist uh, on, on things. Although he had this thing about not really joking about politics much. Because he saw it more as, you know, your job is to make people laugh. But I heard him on an interview recently. He said, I'm not sure if I, you know, I used to want to make people gut laugh. I used to want that big guffaw. But he said, I don't know if that's as important. It's just making people smile. Maybe that's the only thing. Maybe that's the higher calling. Making people smile. So it's not the setup and punch and laugh and laugh and laugh and then the big belly laugh. Although you talk to some comedians, yeah, that's that's it. But to him, it was almost this idea that if you can make people put a smile on people's face, that's all you need to do. Well, I heard that. I said, yeah, I can do that. He also said something in this interview I heard. He said, you know... He said Bob Hope was more important than Richard Pryor because Bob Hope, you never, you never could quote a joke of Bob Hope. He had writers. He just, he just had a style. He was almost like existential. I'm funny. I'm, you know, everything was reduced to a breezy line. He had an attitude of funny that put a smile on your face. And I have to admit, you know, Bob Hope was one of my favorite comedians growing up. And when I was at Channel 4 as uh, an entertainment reporter, one of the many things I did in journalism, re reviewed movies. I was a movie critic. Uh, meeting Bob Hope was kind of a, it, it was a treat. 
it was a treat to meet Bob Hope. I just know being in his presence. He was he wasn't especially funny. He was personable and he was it was like in between shows and he was kind of relaxed. But uh I heard Norm McDonald praise him. He said, you know, Bob Hope, he was like like he had he was almost like a cartoon figure, a cartoon character. Like, you know, and and the example that Norm MacDonald used, he said, you know, like he wouldn't you know, you know, Bugs Bunny, you know, joking about Donald Trump. That wouldn't be the, that funny. You know, so there was something about just being amusing and fun. That was humorous, humoristic. That was the, the virtue, the role of the comedian. That was from the, uh, the mouth of Norm MacDonald. And it, it's kind of stuck with me. It's like, so I, I do this heavy stuff. I talk about all this stuff because I'm a news guy. I, I'm a news guy who likes to crack wise sometimes. And trying to find the, that the median is difficult because you, you're serious and you crack a joke and the serious guys stay away from you. You crack a joke and then you say, oh, yes, but, you know, the that doesn't really mesh with the uh, – uh, the, you know, the, the, you say something nerdy, you know, about the economy, the, the GDP and the, what the hell are you talking about, Emil? And so I, I've sort of made it harder for myself by trying to be serious and funny at the same time. Although look, it's worked for Colbert. It's worked for John Oliver. Although, look, those guys are comedians first, not news guys. Me, I'm the news guy who wants to be funny. So Norm, RIP. He had cancer. And, you know, I didn't know that. And the thing about uh, Norm McDonald's cancer, he had a joke, a joke that he famously has told. I'll paraphrase. He would say, yeah, you know, you got cancer and you die. Well, when you die, cancer dies too. Makes it a tie. And then at the time I heard him say, he say, hey, well, you got cancer and you die. All right, you die, but cancer dies too. It's a draw. He was a big sports guy. Norm McDonald. All right, we're going to leave on a happy note. Birthdays. I got to celebrate birthdays. And I do this because there are people, uh, I, I used to do this because we're, we're on Facebook, but we're also on YouTube now. On the Emil Guillermo, there is an Emil Guillermo YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, put down Emil Amok or Emil Guillermo, and I'll take you to my channel where you'll see uh, my stuff. From, from these talks, plus all my uh, PETA podcasts and my Emil Muck takeouts, the podcast versions of that. But these also, these live stream, live podcast, video. Uh, so happy birthday to, I, I gave a class on meditation and storytelling at Stagebridge in Oakland. And one of my prize pupils, Eleanor Clement Glass. It's her birthday today. Eleanor, happy birthday to you. She gave, she gave a great story at our class, our class show. And if you go to Emil Guillermo, the YouTube channel, it's there. You'll see it. Anyway, happy birthday to Eleanor. Wow. Tremendous, tremendous storyteller. Uh, happy birthday also to Michelle Ganoza. She's my goddaughter that means i am a nino and you can say and every time i see her i say hey hi goddaughter and she says hi she doesn't say nino she usually says hi godfather and then i've got to hide the horse head uh no but she, she does say hi godfather but i'm trying to get her to say hi nino so i can be a nino 
Happy birthday, Michelle. Uh, happy birthday to uh, Tamiko. Tamiko is a, let's see, she's, no, she did chat. If she was on, maybe she would chat. Uh, Tamiko is a, one of my uh, oldest friends from Asian Week. That's where we met. And, and through all the different Asian American things, Tamiko Wong, happy birthday. She does the Asian American calendar. Happy birthday, Tamiko. Thank you for, for listening, except today. When I wish you a happy birthday. And happy birthday to uh, my, she's my, uh, my niece, but officially my cousin. I mean, you know, it's a, she's a niecey cousin, a nice niecey cousin. Charmaine, Charmaine Guillermo. I think she says Guillermo. I mean, that's the way the Filipinos say it. They say Guillermo. They don't say Guillermo. Happy birthday to Charmaine. She's a big sushi expert, a big restaurateur. And uh, thanks to Facebook for reminding me that it's Char's birthday. Happy birthday, Char. All right, so we left on a good note. All this happiness, all these, it's rare that on one day, so many birthdays. So a lot to celebrate, although, as I said at the beginning of this, you know, there's some positive things to take away from the recall, but the negatives, my God, it's hard to vote. If you don't vote by mail, it's hard to vote. And that's why the people who are trying to reform voting by making it more difficult and taking away voting by mail, you must reject those efforts. You must reject those efforts. All right, that's it. All right, we end with a meditation, our lanyap. This whole thing was a lanyap. But as you know, I like to end with a small little meditation. So just remember you are, if you've made it this far, if you're listening, you are worthy. Doff off that robe of shame and walk. Walk forward. You are worthy, worthy of love, worthy of everything. Remember, meal here. May you. Live in safety. May you live in happiness. May you live in good health. And may you live with ease. Till next time. Mahal Kita. <laughs>